They are the dreamers. They are the makers whose minds transcended many realms and have infinite forms, many voices, and singular purpose. So, out the gate, I'll just admit it, I was wrong when I previously said that the precursors were transcendent. I also claimed that the flood and the precursors were the same thing, and while this is partly correct, it's also just as much wrong as it is right. I've taken the liberty of reading a couple more Halo novels recently, specifically uh, Halo Outcasts and Halo Warfleet, in an attempt to double down on my beliefs that all precursors are the Flood and vice versa. Uh, I found the exact opposite. The evidence states that, while yes, the Flood now is a transcendent hive mind of potentially multiple different precursors, but that wasn't always the case. Put simply, while the Precursors are a unified race, they don't view morality as a concept of value. We know at the very least three different factions of Precursors. Those that would become the Flood, who were led or believed to be led by the Precursor known as the Primordial. We also have those that fled the Primordial, and those outside of this universe or reality. The Primordial was the Precursor that the Didact spoke to on Shurum Hakor, and the one that the ancient humans froze in a stasis field of sorts. I know it's not exactly a stasis field, but for simplification's sake, it, we're just gonna call it a stasis field. This is the same Primordial that convinced the ancient humans who imprisoned them to commit Log Off. To explain how the, uh, the Precursors don't view morality as a concept, I have to first explain higher dimensions. In Halo, we know that Slipspace specifically is made up of or interacts with 11 dimensions. We also know that we humans exist in a three-dimensional world with a fourth temporal dimension being time. We are at the mercy of this fourth dimension. Any four-dimensional object would be exponentially as complex as anything within our three-dimensional worldview, just as our three dimensions is exponentially as complex as, say, a two-dimensional or a one-dimensional. As the numbers climb, the complexity also climbs. Current scientific theory states that there are anywhere between 13 and 26 dimensions affecting our universe or reality for this sense. The precursors exist in all of them and outside of all of them at the same time. To explain it a lot better and a lot more clearly, let me give you the example of filters. Imagine someone looking at 13 different filters or sieves all in descending size, with the finest or smallest rocks in the bottom. These different levels of rocks are the levels of detail or complexity. Now, imagine something that is in all of the levels of the filter, while also not being in any levels of the filter. This also isn't mentioning the other realms within Halo that we know exist, such as Denial of Locale, Natal Void, Shun Space, Trick Geodetics, and The Glow, which is a realm of only photons. It's mentioned in passing that the Forerunners had access to these realms, so we can only assume that the Precursors also have those realms to bounce between. It's confusing, I know, but this is just how the Precursors exist. They are said to be anchored in the deepest layers of reality. If they are able to exist in a 13-dimensional reality, then we are nothing more than bacteria to them and they exist above or outside of that somehow. I can't imagine anything short of a 12th or 13th dimensional being being worth the time of the Precursors. Anything short of that is more likely than not just going to be harvested like we harvest crops. What we as 3th or 4th dimensional being, depending on your perspective, experience is such a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what the Precursors actually experience. I'm not sure why the Precursors chose to interact with us, maybe they're also interacting with the higher dimensions at the same time and we're just not aware of this, or maybe the higher dimensional entities are just too finicky and the perfect middle ground is 3. Who knows? This experience is what feeds the precursors. Not the brain matter, but the consciousness itself. Every aspect of experience goes to fuel or feed them, some analog to that. Which is why there wasn't a massive precursor war when the Primordial and his goons got around to the Flood. No matter what aspect of experience, whether it be horror, delight, rage, or even jubilation, all of these emotions are so primitive that they would be no different than different flavors. The Primordial, for example, could like the savory taste of agony and flesh unbound, 
while the precursors who fled most likely preferred the sweet taste of love. It's all just so inconsequential to the precursors that to fight over it is just a waste. I won't fight my best friend, or hell, even my rival for that matter, solely for them liking a different flavor of ice cream. Even pineapple on pizza has only resulted in a couple of homicides, and that's an actual war crime. I think now's a good time to bring up the Domain and some of the theories regarding it. When the Domain is spoken about by the ancient forerunners and the precursors themselves, it's said to hold some 100 billion years worth of experience. This number right there is where we get a few different ideas. I'll try to be as simple as possible, but this is explaining the lore of beings that exist outside and inside of all dimensions and our reality at the same time, so it is going to be wonky. One interpretation is that the precursors vastly predate the Big Bang, or they created it, or something to that extent. Maybe there is a cyclical universe and the precursors have been around for more than one cycle. That's not that hard to believe, since in a couple million years the Forerunners were able to barely scratch the surface of neural physics. The precursors in that case would have had roughly thousands or tens of thousands of times that. By this interpretation, the precursors would be like a type 6 or 7 on the Kardashev scale, since they would essentially be masters of the universe, or the multiverse, or omniverse, or whatever the hell you want to call it. The next couple of theories are more so based off from the interpretation of the 100 billion years of precursor knowledge. The first one I want to talk about posits that the 100 billion years of precursor knowledge that is within the domain is cumulative across the entire precursor a species, or entity, or supercell, or whatever it may be. By this theory, it would mean that there are seven precursors, or at the least seven whole precursors, since we don't know the exact numbers. I'm sure 100 billion was rounding and for less headache down the line when they have to write new lore, and with that number, we get the seven precursor theory, because it just goes to show you how powerful the precursors were. We are never given exact numbers on the precursor species or uh, entities, whatever. I don't want to spend too long getting caught in the weeds on that. Aside from the two precursor essences or spirits that were mentioned in Halo Outcast that are on the planet of Nethrop, and those two were essentially able to, like, nuke, super nuke a planet, so... We know that they're powerful, but that that's for a later part of the video. I want to get on to the last theory of the, the 100 billion year domain thing. The last of the domain theories is either the simplest for you to grasp or the hardest for you to grasp. It just depends on how well you understand hive minds or supercells. This one goes something along the lines that the precursors are a single unified being and every single individual is just a tendril of the larger transcendent precursor being. The best way to think about it is like the Tyranids. Each hive fleet, while acting independently, all works for the same greater organism. Each one has its own goals and functions, but at the end of the day, they all serve the Tyranid. I personally like this theory because it takes the precursors that are already exponentially more complex than us, and then you add another exponential level of complexity on top of that, where what we've been dealing with is essentially a subroutine of the larger creature. We haven't even encountered the individual yet. The true individual, for that matter. All speculations aside, though, I would love to hear your thoughts about it in the comments. And before I move into discussing what happened in Halo Outcasts, I wanted to bring up how precursors travel, because I, I mentioned Slip Space not too long ago. And, uh, boy, is it wild and elaborate. When precursors want to, uh, jump, quote-unquote, from one place to another, like other factions do in Halo, they simply move or transition to another universe or reality and just pop back out into ours at, you know, the desired place. This is technically slower than the use of slipstream like the lesser races use, but Time isn't really an issue if you aren't bound to it like we are. It also has to be said that while this is slower and it does present the precursors with a vulnerability, it doesn't seem to be as, I guess, risky or finicky as slip spaces. The only downside that the precursors have from their jumping or warping or whatever 
is them being very briefly vulnerable while they shed off the residue or, I guess, dust from jumping universes, multiverses, realities, whatever you have. Now, we're going to move away from a lot of the conceptual stuff and move into actual documented history when we bring up the precursor spirits or essences that are on Nethrop, the ones that are mainly spoken about in Halo Outcasts. Way, way back during the first Forerunner War in Heaven, which was the Forerunner Precursor War, uh, it's got a lot of different names, I like First War in Heaven personally. Now, two of these Precursors fled to a pre-FDL society on this planet called Nethrop, where they lived among these primitives doing, I, I don't even know, what does a god do when he's hiding from his children, I just, I don't even know where to speculate. On this planet of Nethrop was this precursor super weapon, essentially, that was called the Divine Hand. The details on the Divine Hand itself aren't important. All you have to know is that during a conflict with a Forerunner Guardian, the planet of Nethrop became essentially Venus after the firing of the Divine Hand. Now, the facts are really, really hazy past that part. Some say that the firing of the Divine Hand itself super nuked the planet, or, if the remains of the Guardian colliding with the planet at terminal velocity caused the planet's uh, less than graceful terraforming. I'm impartial on the matter, but I think it'd be fun to discuss how the Guardian falling could have caused a runaway greenhouse effect. Let's assume that you are a city-sized robot. You weigh roughly a couple street blocks, and suddenly, your lifeless husk of super high quality alloys and heat resistant and kinetic resistant materials start falling into the planet. However the Guardian broke apart, each one of the shards quote unquote, or I don't know, maybe a better word for it is piece of the Guardian, would be the equivalent of the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. Forerunners had essentially mastered metallurgy, and the Guardians are some of their greatest weapons we have to assume that they put some seriously powerful materials into it. I would doubt that more than 10% of the total mass of the Guardians would burn up in orbit, or atmosphere. And that remaining 90% of this city block would hit the planet going a minimum of Mach 10. Altogether, it would make the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs look trivial, or like a child's toy. That's also assuming that there's zero damage from the precursor super weapon, but I can guarantee that there would be some kind of back force generated or something of the analog. The two precursors that took refuge there kinda sorta maybe physically died, but didn't actually die as their essence or spirit or something to that analog resides on the planet. Keep in mind that by precursor standards, this is calm. One time in Silentium, it's mentioned how an entire fleet is essentially forced out of slip space and some of the Forerunner ship just, they just go off to a different reality or universe. So destroying one planet and a single civilization it's pretty stealthy by precursor standards. I think the end of the video is a good time for the writing on the wall schizo to come out as I bring out my craziest theory I've ever come up with and it really has no backing but it's fun, it's theoretical. What if the precursors, while being a transcendent being in this 13th or, or more dimensions, when they project into our three-dimensional with time universe or reality, that they become individuals again? The level of complexity to which they need to express themselves in higher dimensions may not allow for them to be actual individuals as they appear to have been. Again, I have no evidence to support this claim and I don't plan on defending this with any facts. Uh, yes, I'm still gonna hold this as my headcanon. Argue in the comments and you want. Uh, maybe I'll insult your mother if you're creative enough. Who knows? This one is the Skibidi. And took L plus ratio. This one is but Riz and Falk, and is the more Sigma male.